Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, tactics, and strategies they use to run great organizations. Um, today, I'm very excited to be joined by Michael Shu and Maya Kreischmann. Michael is the founder and principal of Michael Shu Office of Architecture. Um, this firm was founded to produce locally engaged design-driven architecture and interiors. The firm advocates a simple and edited design palette using creative materials and techniques to create unexpected results. He has worked previously at OMA, OMA in the Netherlands before returning to Austin and is currently the Texas Society of Architects 2021 Austin Chapter Director, as well as a member of the University of Texas School of Architecture's Advisory Council. He is a past president of AIA Austin and was elevated to AIA's College of Fellows in 2021. His firm has received numerous design awards from the Texas Society of Architects, AIA Los Angeles, IIDA Texas Oklahoma Chapter, Heritage Society of Austin, and AIA Austin, including Firm of the Year in 2016. Maya Kreischmann is managing partner at Michael Shue Office of Architecture since 2007. In addition to managing a broad range of architecture and interior projects, Maya oversees strategic visioning, studio culture, operations, marketing and business development, the whole nine yards. She's leading um, on the office's recent growth in Houston, into Houston, where the firm established a second office in 2018. Maya holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia and a Master's of Architecture from the University of Texas at Austin, where she was also served as a guest lecturer. Special thanks to Chase Daniel for helping us organize this conversation and as always, a uh, warm welcome to Chris Morgan, um, our, our co-host here today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really excited to start this conversation. And, uh, you know, I think maybe Chris can kind of lead us off in the first in the first question here. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. The title for this talk was How to Grow from 17 to 71 in Seven Years. A slight correction. The firm grew actually from 21 to 78 in the last seven years. So what I was hoping is that, Michael and Maya, if you could walk us through that, uh, that seven-year growth, uh, just some of the highlights of that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, George. We're so happy to be here. And to everyone who's listening and appreciate uh, you, you logging on to uh, listen. The, the sort of business of architecture is something that if you would have asked me 15 years ago, if it was an interest, I, I would have said no, I think. But um, it's, it's definitely an important part of our practice. And we, we couldn't do what it is that we love doing if we didn't pay attention to the, all the other sort of facets of our profession. Um, so thank you for having us uh, on this sort of talk. In a, in a nutshell, the growth that we experienced um, in the last seven years, and I'll even talk about going back to the very beginning, was it really is in parallel with the growth of Austin in many ways. Austin was a market that, you know, you didn't see Austin named in the normal journals. We were a B sort of city. It was a place where actually finding work was quite difficult. Um, graduating from UT, work was hard to find. Um, the work that was here was essentially residential and adaptive reuse, remodels. Um, there really was an industry here until sort of tech and some other people found us and sort of the market uh, sort of grew into what it is um, today. Um, so we, the background for the partners is, is really in that small scale adaptive reuse, custom residential and hospitality. And it's continued to inform how the office goes about the practice of architecture and the business of architecture, even though we're you know, much larger than that. Um, so the, one of the big mitigating factors for the growth is really, um, we are a local firm that when we were presented with new project types, we wanted the opportunity to take a little bit of risk and say yes. So when we were approached to do a new like a hotel project, right? South Congress Hotel was about seven years ago. Um, it was a job they were actually turned down because we were nervous. It was a big stretch for us. And um, we've had quite a few of those inflection points to where we're like, can we do this? Can we do this sort of safely? Uh, who are we putting at risk here? Um, and, and every time we, we cautiously said yes. And so we've grown primarily to sort of work in new places within architecture, including interior design. So from the very formation of the office, interiors were completely integral. Uh, as 
as you can imagine in hospitality, that's that's de rigueur. They, they, you know, hospitality doesn't really draw boundaries between our usual sort of silos of design, and that's something we we love. Um, so as we're you know sort of growing, we 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 continue to do homes. We did more and more restaurants, and then we started doing workspaces, ground up office buildings, small scale commercial. Um, now we're architect of record and interiors and and designers for projects at uh, are a few hundred thousand square feet. We're design architects on projects now that are even significantly larger than that. Um, in each case, we we love the variety that architecture provides us, and the profession generally um, kind of pushes you within a niche. and And we wanted to see what it could be like if we if we didn't do that. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to know along along that journey. Um, when when did uh, Maya? When did you join the team? Uh, so Michael hired me at a previous office, uh, but I came on with him just uh, really two years into the firm. So we were only five people, uh, and now you know 78 plus with interns. So um, I don't think anyone saw that one coming for sure. But um, at the root of it, I think the the nice thing is that as Michael discusses our studio in many ways still functions the same. I'm still working on teams that are very small. Um, everyone is really doing design. They're getting into the thick of problem solving um, you know, in construction. They're uh, testing out ideas that we had never done before. And so all of those things that really, I think, drew me to this place originally still fundamentally exist. And I think that's always the pulse that we're kind of measuring our success by. Is there a period in the firm that was the fastest growth period? Uh, last two years. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we, um, it was interesting actually to, to come here today. And I think we always knew, we knew our growth curve or not, it's not even a curve trajectory was really a straight line. So I think the first thing that we're really proud of, and I think that we work hard at is um, that we're pretty conservative when it comes to bringing on people. They're not hired for projects. We're really hiring for talent. Um, and we, we look for it pretty much constantly. Um, but, you know, for a good chunk of the history of this firm, it was two, three, maybe a flat line here, but it was about that sort of growth pattern, um, but never a roller coaster. So you won't see ups and downs and, and peaks and valleys. Um, and then, you know, pandemic hit, you know, I think 2019 was a very starting very strong. Um, we knew Austin was starting to really catch wind um, and, you know, our, our clients were coming from many more places than just the surrounding areas. Um, during the pandemic, we were at least able to sort of keep everyone intact. Um, our, our project base is so diverse that that is really fundamentally the thing that I think really kept us um, stable and we're, we're proud of that. And as people, I think, started to, to reach out of the times, they were optimistic. Um, they were looking to Texas to grow um, the sort of outskirts of places like Colorado, you know, we're starting to see the sort of new trends in, in living um, and, and should say also in residential, many people wanting to do um, improve their living environments, which has been a, a really nice trend in the office as well. So that a, a collection of those things has really led to our growth in the past two years. In terms of the different functions that you oversee, um, you know, the marketing and business development side and all that, um, was there... Was there, um, like how much of it was sort of push versus pull, right? Did, were you finding that more people were coming to you or was it, were there other changes that were happening internally that made it easier to bring people to you? Yeah, we um, have been very thankful. Um, we've worked very hard at the, the client relationships with we, that we have. Michael's first client is still a client of ours that we have multiple projects going on with at all times. And so we were very much in a, um, you know, kind of a yes mentality to the people that we wanted to work with. Um, and so I think that it's been really important that when we maintain those, then they refer us and they're, they're referring us to like-minded creative people. Um, so they're the people that we in general want to work with. And so that has been a huge chunk of our um, work, re repetitive clients. And, and then the notion that we do want to stretch our wings. And so, you know, sort of starting to work in further notions of our community. We're doing work with the transit partnership here in Austin right now, for instance, and so things like that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I grew up through recessions in Houston. I grew up in Houston. You know, this office went through the Great Recession. Um, 
you know, I saw a lot of economic uh, hardship with my parents. So I, I was always, always about trying to, we we're trying to be conservative. Like how do we hedge against this profession that, that really just blows up and shrinks like based on the economy. Um, and be, because it's just a tough model. Um, you can't, it, it's hard to sort of build people up and, and sort of retain the staff that you work so hard with and want to be a part of um, with that sort of cycle. So that was something that was really important to us. So a diverse portfolio was 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 really, really important. Um, and then uh, what was it going to um, And, you know, a, a lot of the growth has been saying like, um, typically in architecture, you grow to a certain size and you have to slough projects off. You can't do a project under a certain fee uh, because it makes no financial sense. And I, we get that. I, we see the numbers, and that's that's a reality of the profession. But um, we also saw the value in retaining clients because clients who grow with us, like if they have a similar growth trajectory, well, they're going to change when, as we change. So we try to identify those. And then it's it's also about um, making sure that we still retain those sort of say scruffier, smaller, hands-on projects that really informed our design process. That typically when you go to an architecture firm, you end up designing what that firm has always designed. And we felt like that was a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a dead end of design. Um, and it just happened to be the sort of strategy which was at once about survivalism and, and also about self-preservation, also about an excitement of architecture wanting to sort of reach a larger audience than maybe uh, firms are, are capable of a lot of times um, worked out well as a diversity strategy. I think I think we use that as well to sort of diversify our own offerings. And it wasn't necessarily for diversification's sake. It was, I think, a real interest in knowing that architecture doesn't stop with the things that are attached to the walls. And a lot of that came from our hospitality clients, um, you know, working with artists, um, doing more custom furniture. And those are really integral parts to our practice. And I think people are very surprised that, um, oh, you do that. There's a lot of sort of surprise in the, the breadth of capability of this place. And, and for us, that's a, that's a proud moment. But I think that's been, um, a, you know, a point of we've, we've now added a graphic designer to our team and things that we've always um, sought to do and we're are kind of actively already designing things like signage and environmental graphics, um, but to have those as a part of not only our own to toolkit, but to start to invent in realms like graphics or landscape um, in furniture um, has always been a kind of real uh, goal of the office too. When you've been presented with these opportunities that you mentioned before, like the South Congress Hotel, where you feel a bit nervous about the new risk that you might be stepping into. So you're trying to be conservative about um, how, if you're gonna take it on. And then you ended up taking it on. I'm just curious like what the conversation was at that time and how you, uh, what, was it a long period of time where you really like racking your, your minds together to evaluate? Just be, be curious to hear like a little bit more of the story of maybe the, the pivotal, pivotal moment where you decided, you know, we're going to do this. Let's orient the practice around it. Yeah. Um, we usually don't get much time to decide, you know, usually they come to you and you're like, Hey, I need to know next week if you're, if you're in and out and what are your fees and can you, can you staff this? And we need to get out of the ground in X months the, all the usual sort of pressures of architecture. Um, so what's interesting about architecture is we don't, many times get the strategic sort of grace periods we wish we had. I mean, to um, people ask me like, oh, did you plan the office in this way? Did you and my and your partners and everyone else plan? It's like, well, to be perfectly honest, no, because this profession is very much about opportunism coupled with sort of intentionality. Um, and those two things are, are you know, you're, you're, you're at the sort of whimsy of those things. If a big project walks in, um, do you say no to it if you don't have, if you're already busy, right? Like, what do you do? If there's a project that is extraordinary, you want to do it, but you know it's going to put your staff and yourself under pressure. It's like, how do you how do you mitigate those things? And almost always it's about, hey, how much pressure is this going to put on our staff? Can we hire for this? Um, you can't hire soon enough, almost always, uh, to keep up with the real estate. Um, so th these are these are some of the questions that we've always sort of asked ourselves, and Maya's, you know, really, 
<laughs> I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I get to be a little bit more, um, uh, you know, cavalier about it, but Maya's really, you know, has, has like full purview of like, hey, this is what we can and can't do. Which is a very tough thing. Um, we, are, we are an office that um, has been privileged to have a lot of great potential work come in front of us. And we're also an office that doesn't really want to say no, because I think also, you know, at, at the fundamental core of this place is that we believe that design can be for everyone. Um, and that, so that means all budgets, all scales. Um, and so we want to make sure that we make room for all of those things. Um, and I think particularly being in a city like Austin, you know, certainly when the the firm kind of changed a little course, you know, was when we were getting the opportunity to do full city blocks of this town. And I think most architects would uh, have a huge pit in their stomach, which is exactly what we did. Um, but also then at the end of the day say, well, we have to be a participant in our city um, or we can't complain about sort of what's happening here or let's figure out this, let's understand why buildings and developments look the way that they do, the constraints and things like, and the rules before we get to go out and break them. And so that's been a, a key piece of what we're doing here. But we, we, we know that we can do that through new development. We know that we can do that through adaptive reuse, uh, through the uh, I don't know, interior at the, the size of a postage stamp and, and all of the above. But it's not easy. I will say, even as we're talking about this, um, I constantly have a little pit in my stomach and normal pit is good. Um, so we just try, we try to control that, that amount of anxiety. But um, I think all of us still at the end of the day um, really recognize the kind of privilege we've been given to, to work not only in our cities, but really all over the country too. Uh, uh, going back a little bit to that kind of uh, uh, the opportunism versus and, and the, in, the intentionality that kind of have to be in place together. Um, is there frameworks in place that have been set over the years in order to understand what makes a good opportunity? Like, is there, do you have an internal checklist of sorts of kind of due diligence to know like, okay, you know, um, because, because to make that the, you know, this is a worthwhile bet basically that we need, we should make strategically as a business. Um, how, because it, obviously it's a multidimensional problem that you have to address. And I'm just curious if there are frameworks in place that you've been able to put together to help you answer that in some way, or at least get to like more clarity when, you, when you're when you presented with a potentially large opportunity or of any scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start and then my should you know, please follow up. I, I think very early on, uh, we even had a scorecard for how to go about project selection. And we try to keep it very concise because too much data is, can be debilitating. Um, and it was the usual metrics is who is this serving? Is this good for us? Are there design opportunities? Can we at least break even financially on this? If no, and this becomes a little bit more, or if it's a pro bono project, is this an audience that we, we believe in and want to serve? And, and we just ask those sort of basic uh, questions. But, but you're right, it's, it's, it's much more complex than that because then you balance out staff ability, technical ability, uh, location, um, right now we're doing projects in, you know, cities and locations, uh, probably 10 different places right now. It's like, can we maintain quality? Can we maintain sort of service at a distance? And if not, what do we do? So a lot of the last, I'd say four years or so have been about how do we design the structure of an organization? So our design thinking, it wasn't about let's design a building. It was like, how do you design an architecture practice? And I think, I think early on, um, much of what we were given and what we found was this whole notion that um, if we found someone, you know, maybe X, X would lead to X. And a lot of that was the decision making of, okay, maybe this isn't the premier project, but we're seeing what this person is up to. Let's take a dive, form a relationship and hope that it leads to that. And I think it, it did in general. Um, and I think that that thought process is evolving a little bit. You know, again, we're still working with those same clients, but I, I think it's it's not unlike hiring, but I think it's a different metric. You know, we, we're very much risk takers in this office. Obviously, we're architects, we follow the rules, but we want to take creative and, and risks it even in the way that we set up the studio. And I think our most successful clients of the world are doing the same thing. And sometimes you know, that starts out very small and very slowly. Um, and, you know, even some of our longest term clients now has led to, you know, really um, 
creative mixed use developments that I don't think any of us really saw that was going there, but we saw what they were trying to do even on the smallest of projects. And so I think now we can kind of see that a little bit more clearly when we're, we're talking with firms. And, um, and I think, you know, now we, we sort of evaluate our, it's not all about design, but I think, you know, it's certainly wanting to be part, a part of a collaboration with someone um, and working towards something that, you know, people haven't seen before. What can happen sometimes um, with firm leaders is that it ends up that they can be a bottleneck to growth. And I'm curious how you've reflected on that as you've been growing um, and as an individual leader of the firm who has more and more of a team uh, that you're, you're, you're leading. I'm just curious, how have you been reflecting on your own and working through some ways that you can grow to step up to the challenge of the next sort of tier of scale as a leader? So I think, Chris, you're hitting on, uh, we just about a week ago spent um, a full day talking about this very question. So um, certainly as our you know strongest growth has been in the past two years, um, that's exactly what we're running into, right? There's a, there's a smaller group of us who have been here for a longer time, who are immersed in the values of this place, who are immersed in um, you know, how, how do we approach design? I won't even say how we do design, right? It's an approach. Um, and so thus being a design driven firm, you know, even though we have grown, it still takes that sort of level of understanding to come to know how we might approach a restaurant versus another studio. So I think there's, there's no short answer, but I think what we have always done, and I think Michael has really led this is, um, a, known that it's about the team that he has, and so it's about every single person that we hire, and also that, you know, we really believe that we can find strengths in people, and when you give them slightly bigger shoes, they rise to the occasion and want to fill it. Um, and this is a team, this is a, essentially, again, a kind of studio that's a fairly flat organization. Uh, we call ourselves a little bit of a culture of generalists because we um, want to sort of, again, take projects from start to finish. It isn't siloed. It's the anti-silo. Different project teams, every project. I mean, it's a little infuriating some days, but we love it this way. Um, and it keeps us creatively super fresh. And so I think that, you know, it, it, but it, what it also does is really give people opportunity because we have still have the small projects in our office, we can have quite young designers starting to learn client management. Um, we can even have quite young designers starting to learn how to write proposals. Um, to our, all of our contracts are actually public to our teams so that if those teams wanna have those conversations about profitability or where we are on the project, um, we wanna be transparent about that. And we made a big push in the past two years to actually make uh, the sort of prog pro or progression or tracking of our contracts public to our staff um, and also that they know sort of what to expect in the weeks ahead about what they're working on. And, you know, those are all, I think we've tried to function from that place of transparency and in doing so, when you give people information, they feel empowered. Um, but getting, getting growth, and I think architecture is still a steep hill to climb as far as knowledge is concerned, and that, that's always the challenge. I, I mean, I, you know, we're, we're big fans of transparency here in Monograph. So I, I think I'm, what I'm very curious about is where did that, where was that decision? Where did it come from, right? I mean, like, was it something from previous experiences that either yourself, Maya, or, or Michael had had before in the past where that you wanted to bring that to, to this office? Or was it something, uh, you know, how, how does a conversation like that start? Because you know, from our perspective, there are a lot of firms that have very different opinions about transparency and might see it as, um, you know, it's important to not sh showcase some of that information because it could be distracting or, um, you know, and so, you know, uh, for, from our perspective, we always see it as an empowerment for autonomy that can actually lead to better results than, than kind of, you know, sort of keeping people within a specific lane. So I'm very curious to know, where does that idea even start from within the firm? Yeah, I think it's a cultural thing. I think it has to start from the DNA. I think it's very hard to sort of shift gears. Um, I think you have to be formed in that sort of way. And, um, uh, you know, our, our, our approach is just a little bit more communal um, and, and inclusive in that way. Um, 
And I think the basis of that really starts from, if you want to just talk about me personally, is uh, sort of trying to be self-aware. I think a level of self-awareness is, is so important. Um, so knowing that, hey, there are things I'm good at, there are things I'm not great at. So, hey, and, and vice versa for everyone on our team. Um, so for me to be able to sort of do our best work, I have to recognize and accept that. And I have to pass on those things to other people and I have to let people help me. And then I have to help other people. Um, and then we're hopefully greater than a sum of our parts, right? So that's, that, that's the impetus for this. And that's where the sort of questions of authorship and ego in design um, can kind of come in conflict with some of these things about transparency. So this is something we try to have real conversations with. Um, that's why, you know, in our office, we talk about people who are, um, who are provocateurs and, and, and maybe, you know, disruptors on design. And then we have people who are experts, like the people that hold our feet to the ground and make sure that the buildings don't leak. And we each play different roles. And on a different project, you may have a very different role, um, but it keeps us all very nimble. I think we're an office of very, very curious people. Um, you know, people who maybe like myself have a short attention span who want to sort of design everything, but know that they can't, uh, but they want to also do it with people. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, the firm is really about this goal of forming sort of spaces and experiences that truly connect with people at a behavioral and emotional level, right? This is where architecture is most powerful. You think back to all of the spaces I've been in, the ones that sort of just blew me away, the ones that I feel, the ones that make your eyes water, you know, you want that connection. And you can't do that just through me or through a handful of people. That has to be collaborative in a way that is deeper, um, that requires transparency, because that's the only way to build trust with people. And without trust, there's no, there's no engagement and no ownership and the work suffers. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, and Michael knows there's been many of days where I've maybe wanted to keep things, hold things a little tighter, right? You know, because transparency can equal vulnerability. But on the flip side, it's actually the opposite is really true. You know, if you really have a confidence in the belief of what, what you're doing, then there really should be no risk, you know, um, because there's sort of roots that are deep. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what, what I found even in the early years of this place was um, a kind of faith in, or, or I don't know, an opportunity to really um, participate much more than I had seen in any other office. And this was, you know, way, well before any of the things I'm doing now. And there was an appeal there. And I think that's what has certainly kept me here for 15 plus years. Um, and I think it is, you know, it, as much as it can be frustrating some days, everyone is, you know, the people that we want to surround ourselves with have the kind of best ambition. Um, and I think when they feel like they've gotten investment even beyond the sort of typical project things, um, you know, we have people that have formed, um, you know, peer design review groups, you know, people will come to us with sort of different ideas about um, how to get design further in the firm or how to approach sustainability. And so we have a series of leadership teams within the office at a baseline of, you know, setting goals for different parts of the firm that allow them to participate. And, you know, how do you, how do you um, budget for these things? You know, is how much, you know, overhead to do these like aspirations take versus the reward we're going to put into it. Um, and that's, you know, at the top of the leadership and all the way down to, you know, what, what new social events could we do to keep, keep this thing fresh and keep it fun between everyone as well. So. It, I think it. we talk a lot about um, making sure that every day we're not only a teacher, but we're here to learn and that at every level, um, everyone genuinely has a voice here. Um, and I think that that rings true. And I think people feel like that that is the case. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, and we talk about sort of balancing values. So um, it's individuality and independence, but it's always coupled with sort of you know, responsibility and leadership. That doesn't mean we don't have, we don't get to be leaders. We don't, you know, we, we don't get to be responsible. It actually means the opposite. It means that, you know, it's the job of the partners to make an organization that allows risk to be taken, that allows someone's voice to be heard. And that's the hard part to just, you know, for chaos is easy. You just, you know, but that that's not how you can build an enduring firm the structural components underneath all of this 
sort of looseness is the is the been the difficult part, but it's been the essential part of uh, of getting to the size that we are right now. Michael, there's a really great moment in a previous interview I've seen with you where you talk about um, seeing entrepreneurship as uh, as creativity, as a way of um, being creative. And thinking back to your earlier comment about growing with your clients, which I think is really fascinating. Um, have, have there been clients that you've had this relationship with where you've you've been talking with them about just the general idea of growth and building an organization as sort of like a companion or colleague sort of um, as you're seeing them grow and you're helping them grow by doing projects with them. I'm just curious what kind of maybe conversations show up where you notice overlaps between uh, running and leading an organization. Yeah. um, Yeah, uh, definitely. There, there are a lot of um, those parallels. Um, I, I think one of the things that's been really interesting about entrepreneurship is this, I think, I think in architecture, uh, a lot of the um, sort of uh, maybe preconceived notions that I had about design was like small boutique studio is good, large office, bad, right? So, um, and I think a lot of what I learned from our clients is like, um, that doesn't have to be the case. And there's lots of examples of firms that are not 10 or 15 people that are that are larger than we are for sure that do great work and it, it's a really it's a structural approach right it's like authorship can't re, can't can't sort of live within a tight tight you know one person especially because we do so many different types of projects right we have a large list of projects um, but that sort of learning that we had in observing in the early days of Austin to where you know there weren't big projects it was really people, bootstrapping small projects um, and what does that sort of struggle look like and embracing growth and change and risk um, that taught me a lot it's it's the sort of the the narrative for my family as well first generation immigrant you know parents came over ran small businesses um, you know saw a few of them fail so you know surviving survival techniques coupled with sort of a, a growth mindset I think it's only been the last few years that we've said, okay, we do have a growth mindset. Let's let's be real about this, right? What does that look like? Let's 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 work on the structural things that as we get larger, as we've gotten larger, how do we maintain the smallness, which is the interpersonal connections and relationships that are meaningful to us and our clients and our community. And I've always respected, I think, Michael, that he um, knows his own personal strengths, I guess, you know, and then, and then where, you know, our education, especially as architects has kind of fallen short. And so, you know, we've worked with a kind of financial and strategic consultant for, I don't know how many years now, probably the past, certainly the past seven or so, you know, and um, it's, you know, half, half therapy, but more again, getting us to lift upside outside of our heads and also dipping into the strategies of, Um, is it, if it's tech industries, is this someone who actually also works with restaurant clients? And so sort of getting ourselves out of the usual silos of how architecture approaches, um, structuring a firm, um, and all of those things. And, and I think it's been, it's been tremendously helpful. I don't know that we would be where we are without having a little bit of an outs, some outside perspectives into, um, you know, our, what we think our own strengths and growth trajectory could be. Along the way, um, in these past seven years, what have been the most difficult inflection points for the firm? And that can be read in different ways, but you know, yeah. difficult, challenging. I think there are natural break points in our profession. Um, probably when you're about 15 people or so, uh, that's actually really tough between a little over 10, under 20, because it's when the the sort of owner or the principal or the handful, you know, you're doing everything. You're doing biz dev, accounting, bookkeeping, human resources, you're paying the bills, you know, maybe cleaning the toilets, stocking the fridge, you're doing everything. And then maybe you get a little architecture in there. And then you get to be another size where you can hire uh, those things. Um, and that's where growth becomes sort of beneficial is when you get to be a size to where um, you actually get more time 
to sort of work on the things that maybe you're good at or interested in because you have more support in order to do that. Um, so 15 was one, 30 or so was another. That's when middle middle sort of staff really comes into play. It's like, instead of me having a direct relationship with everyone in the office at 15, then it was like, hey, I, I need reliable people that understand what the firm is about, that I can trust that then, you know, is really the day-to-day -day sort of project management. Um, and so after 30, uh, you start developing that. And then of course, um, you know, we didn't have even a marketing person full time until just two years ago, really. Um, and, and, you know, we hired human resources about the same time. Now we have QA, QC that's in house, highly, highly important sort of positions. And really that's, that's about letting us sort of do the design, do the business of designing space. And I, and I think you know, because the partners, again, when we were, when we were five people, I think because there's a, there, there was a sharing of that kind of growth through those times has led to a lot of the culture of us, again, being this, this a little bit of generalists, but also um, wanting to surround ourselves with people that are not afraid to expand their, their toolboxes, but also not afraid to, to get dirty kind of when they need to, right? Because I think there's just a, there's a kind of fundamental mentality of people that are like that. Um, but I think, you know, Michael knows my, certainly my difficult moments have been, um, you know, sort of learning how um, when people leave, you know, how, how do you recover? Um, because, you know, when you're smaller, especially every person, can, and every person always counts, um, but it seems very traumatic when you sort of raised and worked alongside people, they finally know you, they finally know how you work. Um, you know, those have been pain points. And I think also just, you know, pain points personally for me to say, why would, why would they want to leave? You know, I'm, I was hoping we were creating the best place ever. Um, and I think having a mind shift that, you know, A, this is a creative industry. There, there's lots of room to grow and try new things um, that aren't necessarily always related to our studio. And then on the flip side that we've been able to not have to always raise from within. I think that was like a fundamental mentality shift um, to be able to bring in people uh, more senior um, and that they still could function in those levels and not just have to be, um, you know, like I said, home homegrown. And so th those were bigger learning lessons for sure. Maya, was there a moment in your career where you started to realize that you had a knack for the operations and the managing part like the whole managing equation, the business side as well of architecture? I saw this question on your list. I have no idea. Um, but this is where I think um, what we have learned about everyone in our office is that everyone has a strength, right? Even though we, we want to say we're good at everything. We um, have a, a way of sort of evaluating um, our, our staff. And one of the items is high level perspective. And we, and we talk a lot about even agility within the studio. It's kind of one of our values. Um, I think I now know that I'm, I've always been good at that. Um, great at multitasking, but always been able to sort of keep my head up. Um, and I think it, it has been really fun to be a part of the what's next or what if this. Um, and I think then being able to be a part of making those things happen. But uh, no, at the, at the beginning, I'm not sure I, I knew that. I knew I wasn't the best architectural detailer maybe at the end of the day, but um, <laughs> Other than that, um, I think I'm, I, we have a lot of people in the studio like this, but I have a kind of caretaking ability too. And I think I found myself sort of sitting within wanting it to feel really important that this was a place that people wanted to come every day and how could we make it different than the places I had been in the past. Maybe to kind of flip it to uh, Michael, uh, was there a, a moment where you identified Maya's capacity like growing within the firm? Um, yeah, pretty, I mean, all our, all of our partners have uh, a very generalist sort of ability, um, but I think it's this ability to think strategically and um, that, that it's, it, it's, it's tough and, and not everyone has it. I, th I think, um, and Mai is an incredible person and an incredible partner and, and really a tremendous part of why we are where we are and, you know, and, and have and done so well. Um, but, uh, um, 
she, when, when we were about 20 or so or 25 is when I started taking partners on. And it was really about, we were getting sizable enough to where we we're still all doing sort of the same jobs, but there was a certain time where it became too much for, for me, for sure. And I, you know, you have to have help. I think it's this idea that, Hey, you, you got to have help. And she, she absolutely was a natural fit. I mean, it's just, she's incredibly well-rounded. I mean, I, I mean, I say this about Maya all the time. She's a, like a natural born architect, but really a kind of a natural born architect business person as well. Um, and I think really when you look at to the top of a lot of firms, generally there's at least one or two people like that at the very top. Um, and it, this is a really interesting question because there was one time in our history that we, we sort of said, hey, should we go hire a chief operating officer, someone to just run the business, right? Let us do design, you just run. And, and we decided that that wasn't gonna work, that um, we'll end up turning into a business and not an architecture firm. So we, we still, even the consultant that we have, that's a business consultant has been with us for years. Um, he gets what it is that we are culturally. And without that understanding of what our profession is like and the goals of the firm, um, I don't feel like we could have been successful. So we're, we're very fortunate to have, you know, people like Maya, my other partners, Jay and Micah, and then um, a whole slew of leaders and associate partners that are coming up through the ranks right now. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it, um, I don't think anyone, you know, you, you experience a certain level of uh, decision-making or calls just, you know, and running construction and architecture, you know, and then I think somehow along the way, um, maybe I knew I had at least a little bit of a knack to make calls on a bigger scale too, but those are really not easy. <laughs> um, especially when you're sort of talking about potential, you know, livelihoods and things like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's a, a part of it too, um, where school doesn't really do a very good job of sussing this out for people, but there is, there are people who really care more about the system side of architecture. They get fascinated way more on how, the complexities of the site, the complexities of all the variables and how you resolve that into a design solution versus there are people who really are much more tactile. They care more about the actual fabrication component of a, of a project. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something to, it's for those in the audience to think about when you're even recruiting people, like how do you start to understand early on, like where do they naturally lean towards? Uh, is it systems thinking or is it much more like, no, this person really cares about the detail. Um, and, and those are important to recognize so that you can you know, carve a, a, a career path for them as well within the firm. But do you have any, you mentioned this like chart, a way that you're sort of helping understand your team, uh, and these different characteristics. You mentioned agility being one. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is, is it something that's kind of like systematic that you, because there are firms that we've, we've heard from that are very systematic in how they come to understand the, uh, the goals, the career goals of their staff, and they track it to, to be systematic about provide, making the firm provide a, a growth path for those, um, those team members. Yeah, it's also top of mind of uh, a firm that is growing um, in the, I guess, um, twofold. We've, at, at some point we did construct a sort of self assess I hate these words, we need a better term for it, but a self-assessment for of our staff members. But, you know, I think what we knew at the time, but maybe wasn't so poignant was it's led by the sort of values of, um, you know, kind of being, being a team member here. And so that's everything from design skill to high level perspective to client management, um, you know, constructability, a little bit more about um, being an architect, but also trying to pinpoint a few of those things that sort of can take you into the next levels of kind of being, being also a firm leader in addition to a project leader. Um, but it always came from the staff and it was sort of just a way again to help lead a self-reflecting kind of conversation um, on a yearly basis. And that was, generally what we did. Um, I think off to the side, especially when we were a smaller firm, just trying to have those, um, you know, kind of casual mentorship conversations about professional growth. I think certainly as we've grown now, we actually just launched a more formal 
mentorship program to, I think, more tap into people just getting to have conversations with others that are in either a very advanced part of their career or sort of similar and seeing if they're experiencing the same thing. But I think we are finding that, um, you know, as we have done promotions within the firm, I think everyone has aspirations, um, but they're not necessarily all the same. And I think what we did find was um, a sort of title or the role and the stress that comes along with those titles isn't a one fits all. And so we've been having a lot of conversations about how you can have different um, strengths and even different aspirations and still have a longevity here um, and have a place that you feel like you can contribute to. So I think that has really taught us that we need to have more active conversations about um, you know, desires of people rather than saying, yes, you are good. You know, you should, <laughs> you should move forward. Um, and that's been really refreshing actually. And I think was kind of um, a, a real eye opener. though. I think we've always in general followed, there's always a gut reaction of, again, of people, right. That your clients trust um, and that, you know, have sort of generally um, had a real interest in the firm. That's actually a kind of differentiator for us and our leadership is not just a great project manager, but wanting to sort of be in front of the firm to lead things like sustainability or our, you know, interiors or furniture or things like that. Yeah, I think this is a part of the profession also, much like the business side of the profession, like how do you develop leadership that that's a, you know, it's a big challenge, um, but it's a requirement for us. Um, one of the reasons to grow is so that people inside your firm can grow with you. Uh, when you're a static size, well, the, the firm doesn't change, the makeup doesn't change, the project types usually don't change. Um, it's, it's, it's a different type of office. Um, so one is about growth, but it's also about stability because we, you know, we want to kind of keep working with the clients and the people that, that come to us and are a great fit for us and, and vice versa. Thank you for that. I think we can kind of transition to some of the questions that have been um, being added here in the chat. Um, a very, uh, Marjan Pearson, who's a, a, a wonderful person and a friend of Monograph, um, she asks, with your focus on client relationships as well as significant growth, approximately how many, quote, anchor tenants, clients, or do you have um, the ones with whom you have close relationships with the client, like percentage base, like what would, how would you classify that in terms of the business? We have, we definitely have, a, <laughs> we definitely have a few of those. I think if you look back to the uh, sort of history of the office, you know, Maya mentioned the first client. Um, the first job we did for this client was a $10,000 project. Um, now we're designing uh, developments that are up to a million square feet for this sort of person. Um, and they've been the largest sort of single source of billing that's also become a personal friend. Um, this is someone that diversified from restaurants into, you know, into all other sorts of businesses and like uh, real estate. Um, and, and this is someone who we think of as a creative partner, right? This is a client, quote unquote, and a developer, quote unquote. But um, this is someone who has sensibilities that are lined up with us. And that's almost more important than the number. It's like, if you can find one, just one person who has a similar trajectory, uh, career goals and sensibilities with you, that's kind of all you need. Um, and, and then nurture those. And it's one of the reasons we grew because at a certain point, we, in order for us to not grow, we would have to say no to projects. And you know, as human beings, when you say no to someone, you can say no to someone once and maybe they'll come back and go, hey, will you look at this job? You say no to them twice and they're, they're pretty much gone. And then uh, that opportunity becomes sort of a dead end. And, um, and, and we didn't want to have to, to do that um, with people who sort of trusted and believed in what it is, was that we were doing. Hmm. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. I think our repeat percentage is very, very high, but as everyone knows, don't underestimate how small this world is too, you know? And so I think that's always been the, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, during COVID, we started tracking carefully like repeat clients and for a while there it was 100% monthly, 100%, 100%. You know, they got us through uh, this last year where we we actually grew and, and hired and we're able to sort of 
take in very talented, great people that were coming to Austin from other places or within Austin, um, looking for new opportunities, a change in their life maybe. And, you know, we wanted to say yes to them. Um, and if we didn't have a growth mindset, if we weren't also optimistic um, and then clients that we believed in and who were giving us messages like, yeah, we're gonna come out of this soon and we're prepared for the next sort of stage as opposed to clients who are like, we're done, <laughs> we're tapping out. Uh, thanks for all your help, but you know, we're, we're um, it was very optimistic and we we're able to say yes to some great people and, and it, it's really improved the office and made us a better, better organization. Um, another question here, um, can, I think on the flip side of what makes a great client, um, have there been um, any red flags or just, you know, a couple that you can share, just like things that you were like, okay, that's, that's definitely on the criteria of like, do not uh, want to work with that type of person or client or the project type even that it could become more too complicated for, for what it's worth. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I hate to blanket say, you know, things like schedule or budget, but those are things we evaluate. I don't think there's a, a hard low number, you know, I think we're sort of evaluating the value that they want to put into the dollars that they have. Um, I think there's a certain, again, alignment to um, wanting to, to have some creativity and push the boundaries, you know, as opposed to um, sort of something that uh, feel, feels sort of fixed or already pre pre prescribed, I guess. Um, and then, you know, I think it's, I mean, I think that that's at a basis. I think, you know, in many ways we evaluate clients also as general people, you know, so you're, you're in this for quite the long haul. And so you want to be alongside someone, which we know we're not going to get along every day of the whole project, but um, that again, at the end of the day has um, a, a, a vested interest in similar things, right. Um, and that we can come to the table and feel like respected um, team members rather than sort of being told, or I, I know better in all aspects, right. That there, that there's a mutual respect. And I think that probably at the end of the day, when, when there's a gut feeling that that's not there, that's usually, usually the highlight. I think those are spot on. I think one thing I'll add is um, just a little bit of background research in the clients can go a long way. If you've seen what they've done previous to it, um, you can kind of get an idea of what their sensibilities and values are pretty quickly. Um, I think you mentioned this. Um, was there an inflection point that led to that discussion internally about moving towards a growth mindset? Um, maybe you can unpack that a little bit about what, what the growth mindset for those that might not be familiar, because there's a there is a book also called talking specifically about the growth mindset. I'm curious, that's part of the inspiration. I think it wasn't, I think it was more, I think an acceptance that growth doesn't equal bad, you know? Mm, yeah. um, and I think it just became a point where it was actually holding us back from uh, somewhat planning for it, but also embracing that this could, this can lead to like, we want to do it because of all of these things. And if we wanted not to do it, we know how to, but no one wanted to accept those methods, right? To say no to things, to um, limit your client base, to, you know, either stick to repeat client, you know, there's a whole slew of things that could limit you to a certain size. And none of our teams wanted to do that. I think we just, there's always a fear of uh, dilution. I was actually talking about this earlier this morning, right? That's our eight, architects, a number one fear. Um, and it is real. Um, and so I think that's, that's where, when we could accept that this was um, a part of our future, especially given the cities we're working in, now we can sort of say, well, how do we make sure that we're not diluting it in the planning of the strategy of the firm? So I think that, that was even within the last year or so, we just, it's kind of one of those, okay, we just need to get on board. We all know that we need to control and do this in a very um, strategic and concerted way, not, you know, but I think it, it, it helped us to sort of align um, the thoughts moving forward rather than kind of go kicking and screaming. Yeah, really a lot of the anxiety and the sort of stress of growth and size, um, you know, when we talk to people, those things are best mitigated with organization and structure. And, and so then I was like, okay, of course, that makes so much sense, right? Yeah, I mean, you, um, but how, how much of that do you do? Do you start siloing your office into studios? One does hospitality, another one does 
you know, interiors and another one does ground up commercial, another one does, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that sort of structure. It was more of the sort of, uh, sort of softer structures that had to do with the, the organization of the business in an office to sort of take some of the pressure off that and developing leaders who could lead other leaders or leaders that can, um, that can train others um, that have the sort of, uh, not only the, the ability to do that, but the desire to do that. We did do that exercise. I'll be super candid. We actually said, do we want to reorganize this place? You know, and I think we needed to kind of go through the exercise to understand the things that make this the strong place that it is. Um, and our leadership needed to do that and sort of um, be a part of what happens if we wanted to plan this place differently. Um, and it was actually, I think, really, really eye opening for everyone. And we certainly gained certain things out of it. But I also think we, at the end of the day, then all, all were aligned that a fundamental, you know, reorganization was not not what was here. It was more of a reflection of uh, a lot of the things Michael just spoke to, the sort of needs and anxieties that were sort of occurring. So we're almost at time, and I, I just wanted to end um, with one question that we like to ask here. Um, it's kind of a, a it, it highlights how much we focus on on the human aspects here at Monograph, and so. Um, the question is, what is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? And we like to kind of take it back to like just people uh, for a minute, even talking about business for a second. So um, we get all sorts of responses for this question. So, you know, we, we appreciate, um, you know, wherever you want to take it, but maybe Maya, we can start for, with you. Oh, that's good. Cause Michael's story is bound to be way better than mine. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I sort of align niceness to kindness. And I think, especially if we're talking about human aspect, um, you know, even within, I think the past year, which was extremely difficult for everyone. Um, I think the kindest thing I found was um, the ability of someone to tell me that I could, you know, forgive myself and sort of allow myself to be a little bit more vulnerable and in, in, in not only in business, but in, in life in general. Um, and those were kind of liberating things. And I think especially given the past year, it uh, felt good. And, I, and trying to do what you do in this position every day to have some grace and forgiveness for your own self uh, felt like a kind of groundbreaking thing. Thank you. Michael? What's really fulfilling, I think, about the office is, um, you know, when we get positive feedback from clients, it's great. Uh, when we win awards, it's it's great. When we're published, it's it's always fantastic. But you know, we we always try to be very humble and not buy in and drink your own Kool Aid, right? Because that's when you sort of lose your edge. Um, I think what's nicest is you know all the thought that we put in the sort of structure of the office, really, which is just just as like a prerequisite to doing great architecture and interiors. Um, it's when our staff comes back to us and says, "Oh, I, I get that." Yeah, you guys do look like that. You're you're being honest with me, and we appreciate that. Or, or I really enjoy what we're doing here um, together. That that that's very fulfilling, I think, um, as opposed to maybe uh, the word nice. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Uh, really appreciate that. So um, with this, I'll just kind of uh, conclude a little bit with a, a plug uh, for Monograph, the you know where where Chris and I both work. <laughs> um, so at Monograph, we're building the future practice operations and back office management for small to medium-sized practices. Monograph is designed by architects for architects. Our three co-founders uh, all went to architecture school and they've worked at different places like SOM uh, in the past. And so we're all really trying to design a solution for the industry. It's a great way to actually see a unifying vision of your firm in one easy and beautifully designed solution. So design is, is really key here. Helps you understand where you are on any given project what your schedules and budgets look like. We have something called the Money Gantt, which helps you to see whether you're on track or on pace on a given project based off of the timesheet data you're getting um, every day. You can start a free trial today at, at monograph.com or watch a live demo with Robert, our CEO, every Friday. You can sign up uh, for that as well. And Chris will probably share the link in, in the chat. Um, thank you both for joining us. Thank you, everyone that tuned in today. Um, and thank you, Chris, again, always, as always. Really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Chris and George. Thank you for so much for having us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. This is a pleasure. Cheers.